The federal government is proposing $40 billion to address compensation and address the failings of Indigenous child welfare in its fall economic update tomorrow. But as the minister said, discussions are still underway. Nothing has been finalized. Patty Haidu is the Minister of Indigenous Services. She's in Thunder Bay. Minister, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, let's get into the nuts and bolts, if you don't mind, um, of this. H how much of this money is for the compensation component? Well, the details of how the money is getting split up between the two large buckets of compensation reform is still under negotiation, but it's roughly half of the total amount in each bucket. But again, uh, the negotiations continue, and um, obviously the government is uh, working really closely with the party to make sure we achieve both of those goals. Is there an aspect of uh, the old putting the cart before the horse uh, thing with that, since negotiations are you know, still ongoing, meanwhile you're setting this money aside? Well, no, I think, um, listen, I think the government has an obligation and an economic statement to be transparent with Canadians about anticipated spending. We've been committed to this process, as you know, um, and these negotiations are underway and they're going very well, I will add. So um, we anticipate that, you know, we will have an agreement and um, that agreement will be in place. So we need to be able to account for the anticipated spending coming. That, that seems to be the consensus that people are, the kind of language people are using today, that, it, that it's close. Um, are you comfortable with the amount? You think this will get to the finish line? Well, listen, I, I think there's no question that there have been historical, uh, historic injustices. And historic injustices require historic um, compensation and historic changes. And I think th that's what we're working on together as, as parties. And I have to thank um, uh, Murray Sinclair for his guidance and leadership in these conversations, along with all of the other parties that are at the table. Everybody is re resolutely focused on two things. One, to compensate the many people and children that were harmed through a system that um, you know, was discriminatory that, uh, that oftentimes um, removed children for uh, circumstances that were beyond uh, anybody's control, uh, the parents' control. And secondly, um, to create a new system, a, a reform, a system that's Indigenous-led, that will ensure that families can uh, stay together, that culture can remain intact, and that children have a brighter future. So with those goals in mind, all the parties have been extremely focused on coming to a resolution. I, th I think it's fair to say that everybody wants a resolution um, on all sides. Um, that said, uh, I think you had originally wanted an agreement in place by December, and, and you know, obviously we're not there yet. Um, now we're looking at the end of the month. What is your degree of confidence uh, that we'll get there by the end of December? And what happens if not by then? Is there a chance this falls off the rails? I don't think anyone wants to see this, um, these negotiations fail. And I will say that, uh, you know, I've spoken with uh, many of the parties myself, as has Minister Miller over the last several weeks, and we sense a sincerity uh, on behalf of everyone. And I think there's a growing trust that the government is very sincere as well to, um, as I said, repair the harms done and, and to move forward in, in terms of uh, the reforms that will require uh, significant investments and significant work on equity, for example, on supports for families, on uh, supports for Indigenous communities to um, create and, and maintain um, systems that will ensure their, their children are safe, their families are supported. These are the goals that we've all had in mind. And for, for me, that gives me great confidence that we will get to an agreement. We have till the end of the month in terms of a deadline, but uh, obviously the government is working closely with partners and we'll assess as we get closer to that deadline um, how things are going at that time. Meanwhile, you've got the court appeal. Does that get dropped? if an agreement is reached? Well, I think the sense by all parties is that, you know, obviously we'll need the blessing of the court to uh, ensure that the agreement meets the, um, you know, the, the, um, the requirements. But I, I think, listen, this is exactly what we wanted to do is we wanted to take this process out of a place of litigation and into a process of staying focused on what matters, which is 
as I've said, reparations to those who've been harmed. But I think equally importantly, if not more importantly, the reform of the system going forward so this never happens again to children and families across this country. But would the federal government be good with dropping the court appeal if there's a deal? Listen, I think all parties are working towards a, a lens where the courts are not involved and that there is a process that's Indigenous led in place for, um, for you know, supporting families in communities and supporting um, healthy communities, healthy families. And as I said, this is what the uh, purpose of these conversations are and what the purpose of these negotiations are to get out of court, to stop using the court as a way to um, essentially uh, deal with these matters and instead work nation to nations, which is the um, true spirit of reconciliation. I don't want to get hung up on the appeal, but you could drop it now, could you not, given that you're close to a deal? Listen, we put the appeal in abeyance with the very purpose of being able to carve out this time to restore trust, to restore these relationships, and to come up with a negotiated agreement that would allow for, again, the principles that I've just spoken about. And I have to, again, thank all the parties for remaining at the table and having these difficult conversations because, in fact, that's what people have done. They've buckled down. They've worked literally day and night to try and iron out the details that will go into an agreement um, that will allow for us to move forward in a good way. So uh, compensation, uh, one giant, a very important aspect of this. The other, of course, you've talked about uh, long-term reform. What specifically are you looking at with that? What, what specifically uh, will it address? Well, the long-term reform is an important part of ensuring that families get the services they need when they need them and that uh, families are supported to uh, remain healthy and remain intact. And, you know, listen, we've all heard the stories of residential school, but in fact, what happened after is equally tragic. Families were removed from their homes uh, solely in many cases for um, uh, for reasons uncontrollable by them, uh, reasons of poverty, reasons of uh, systemic exclusion, reasons of systemic racism and a lack of ability to access care for their children. And um, that's why this work is so important because it's about returning control to Indigenous peoples to care for their children, to have equity in our systems, to make sure that we're held accountable as, um, as systems and structures to, to provide equitable access to service and support. This, this has to stop. Indigenous people have um, every right and every responsibility to take care of their communities and their children in ways that are, are, are culturally appropriate. And, and that's what this reform will do is make sure that that discrimination can come to an end and that families and communities can remain intact. We, we are past time, uh, Minister, but I, I just want to ask, are you comfortable that this will get the job done, that this will do it, this will fix the, the myriad uh, challenges on this? Well, I think it's a really important, um, important piece. Absolutely. I mean, listen, uh, you know, uh, reconciliation and healing from the violence of colonialism is a long term project. Nothing is the silver bullet. But this is an important, important reparation for the government of Canada, an acknowledgement of the harm done and certainly the commitment from a financial and structural and systems um, place to actually uh, do exactly what I think Indigenous people have been asking for for you know, 150 years, which is to um, to restore autonomy and self-determination in their communities. Minister Haidu, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. But as the minister said, discussions are still underway. Nothing has been finalized. How close are the parties to reaching a deal? Cindy Blackstock is the executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. She's in Ottawa. Uh, Cindy Blackstock, thanks for talking to us today. Uh, thanks for having me. So it seems like the indication is that half of this $40 billion will go toward compensation. What are your thoughts? Is that enough? Well, we're, we need to find that out and uh, do that costing. It's in the ballpark. And keep in mind, like that seems like a big figure, and it is. Um, but the reason it's so high, Paul, is because we're talking about tens of thousands of children who are separated from their families because the government of Canada would not provide their families with the same public health supports and social supports and educational supports that other Canadians received. 
And that drove more First Nations children into foster care than at the height of residential schools. And that discrimination is still ongoing. That's the other piece we need to understand. And likewise, the negotiations are still ongoing. Um, you know, this number has been talked about a lot today. Um, but, you know, would you have liked the government to have reached a deal or the two parties, I guess, to reach a deal before this money is earmarked? Well, you know what I would like is actually to see the money in the hands of the uh, victims who have suffered from the discrimination and also to have in place serious reforms to ensure that this uh, discrimination stops and that it doesn't happen again, Paul. Uh, the federal government has hurt successive generations of First Nations kids through residential schools, the 62, but now this generation. It needs to reform itself so that it, this stops and it doesn't happen again. When we look back about the history of this particular case, 24 years ago, when I first came on the national scene and we started costing out the inequalities that were driving these kids into care, it would have been hundreds of millions to settle and uh, to address those inequalities. Instead, the government chose not to do it. And then the more victims happened. And now we're into the billions of dollars, not only to compensate all the kids who are hurt because governments chose not to do the right thing when they had solutions, but also because the trauma in those families intensified. So it's gonna need more resources to address that. And given that those numbers would continue to grow, I mean, the government certainly seemed to be suggesting this is, this is you know, down to the nitty gritty at this point, that an end is near, uh, that it wants to reach a deal by the end of the month. What do you think? How likely is that? Well, um, it's possible to get words on paper, but that's not the end of it. Um, what we need to be looking for is, do they actually pay the compensation in the amounts that the tribunal awarded? And are they serious about reform within the department? They're saying that they are, and I want to believe them, but I want to see them actually do it. And that's the important piece. We've seen so many things over the years where there's been political promises that just have resulted in nothing for children and families. And we need to make sure this is the last generation of kids who's hurt like this. Well, yeah, indeed. I mean, Justin Trudeau has talked about this for a long time, this broad issue. Um, you know, what do you make of the fact that it's taken this long for this government to get this close to a deal? Yeah, it's really sad because, um, you know, there's been a lot of political uh, statements that have been positive, but in the courtrooms, they've been fighting against these kids tooth and nail. And that says to me that the government has to reform itself, that it has to understand that it, it, it right now is discriminating against kids in real time. And so it needs to fix it, not only for those things that we're dealing with in terms of child welfare and the services for a Jordan's principle about health equity and, that, and education, but to deal with water and these other issues too. Because the take home message of this is you pay now or you're gonna pay a lot more later. And the sad part about the later is a lot of people's lives get destroyed when you kick these solutions downstream. So I'm hoping that government really looks at this and decides to end all the inequalities and all public services for First Nations. So, so give me a couple of, of sort of tangible examples. It, like, so we talk about the compensation and as you've said, but the real thing, you know, then the other part of the other side of the coin is reform, real reform. Yeah. So yeah. give me a couple of things. What would you say, here's number one, here's number two, that, that have to be done? Right, well, number one is there needs to be supports in First Nations communities to address the drivers of the overrepresentation. First Nations kids are 17.2 times more likely to end up in foster care, and it's owing to poverty, to poor housing, to uh, substance misuse fueled by multi-generational trauma. We need to adequately fund those particular matters so that families have a fighting chance to be able to raise their kids. And then we need support services for those families so that they can care for the ch children in the culturally based way that they want to. 
The other thing that needs to be done is we actually need to do an evaluation of the Department of Indian Affairs. This is the same department that ran residential schools. Why is it that despite having all these solutions and despite all these positive political statements, this department really is a repeat offender against First Nations kids? We need to understand what's happening there so that it can be changed and that future generations of kids are safeguarded and the government can bring itself into closer alignment with the, what those positive political statements are. We've got less than a minute, but I just you know, need to ask you, having heard all of this today, can, can this country get there? We can get there. And I think one of the things that the public needs to realize is that we are in this moment with that $40 billion announcement because of them, because they're paying attention, because they don't want this generation of kids to be hurt. But the key is don't turn the page. Don't just say that it's done when there's an agreement signed. Keep paying attention until the discrimination stops. That's what we owe those kids. And that's what we owe the residential school survivors. These are their grandkids. So let's take care of them. Cindy Blackstock, very thoughtful. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.